Tony Poulos here at the DSP Leaders World Forum and a new, a new version of Extra Shot. Boy, we're getting through a lot of Extra Shots today and luckily I've had a lot of coffee to carry me through all of these. We've just been through a really interesting session, I think is the best word for it, talking about the future of RAN and building the future with an open, virtual and AI-enabled RAN. We've been talking about this for quite some time. One of the things that did come up today, and I, I'm probably going to start with you. I've got Robert Curran, of course, from Apple Door Research with me, and uh, Martin Halstead, who's the senior distinguished, oh, the senior distinguished technologies at Aruba Telco Solutions at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. That's a really long title. It, it is, unfortunately, yes. Wow, yeah. far too long for somebody like me. <laughs> now, listen, let's start with you, Martin. Rob Joyce from O2 was talking about uh, how he wouldn't be buying virtual RAN until about five years time, or totally buying virtual in five years time. What did he mean by that? So, so I think what he meant was that um, it's inevitable that open RAN, so VRAN and then open RAN are going to, you know, are going to be the predominant technologies in telco moving forward. So, you know, the ship has sailed, that is going to happen. Um, the challenge that they have, which is where the five layer figure came up is, well, actually, there is an awful lot of legacy previous generations out there deployed in base stations, power issues, um, existing contracts, etc., that they have with the leg you know the existing incumbents that are there. So, therefore, you know, when can you change? So, it's not like it isn't going to happen. It's just you know practicalities of when they can go to those open technologies. Right. Uh, would you get the same feeling from that, Robert? It, yeah, I think it was, it, it's clear the direction of travel is clear, but these practical limitations, the, the, and one of the issues for, for RAN deployment in general, let alone open RAN, is, is the cyclical nature. It's a big CapEx investment cycle, and you're not going to replace that every two years. So you've got to kind of get the timing right. Uh, I think now people, one of the concerns about open RAN from the open RAN community had been the risk that it got attached to something like 6G. In other words, pushed a long way into the future. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that's not really quite the case, but, they, but the concern was there. Uh, I think there's two different things we're talking about. We're talking about the, if you like, the, the politics of, of open interfaces um, and uh, supplier diversity, on, particularly on, on radio units and front hall. And the second thing is, is virtualization, the cloudification of RAM. Yep. Um, they're two slightly different, two, two very different things. Sometimes we can conflate the two, but. They, they both have uh, different issues uh, around them, different constraints and different business objectives at the end of the day. Yeah, I think my, my sympathies went out when I heard that some network operators are still running 2G, 3G, oh, yeah. 4G and 5G, and now talking about virtual RAN and AI-enabled RANs in the future. Boy, how do you manage such a vast amount of legacy systems on big networks, particularly something like Verizon across the whole of the US? How are they going to cope with that? Yeah, so I, I think the challenge is, is, and especially with previous generations, um, you know, previous generations um, of radio networks uh, were monolithic, right? They came yeah. from a single vendor. The entire stack is proprietary to that vendor. Um, and so those systems are being, uh, you know, gradually phased out. I think in order for, you know, the entire industry to migrate to cloud-native based architectures, that's already happened within the core. The reason why it's happened within the core is because it's easier to do it there, right? You know, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, it's, cha it's more challenging in the RAM, that's why it's taken longer. In the core, um, you, you already have um, a move, you know, originally with NFV network function virtualization, a move from monolithic applications being moved onto virtual machines on, you know, um, industry standard servers, um, and then a move from those to cloud native, so, um, you know, open architectures, microservices, etc. cetera. Um, the operators love that. Um, and you know, by necessity, are going to have to move to those same architectures across the entire, you know, the, the in, entire telco landscape. In order to do that, you have to get rid of, um, you know, previous generations that aren't capable of going to those, um, you know, microservices, cloud-native architectures. Um, but, you know, as the generations move forward, the industry is going to get there. But that's presumably a very expensive exercise as well. Um, how are they going to accelerate the move to open RAN and virtual RANs? I think it's a bit of push and pull, to be honest, uh, Tony. The, the, 
the, the pull is towards the greater agility and so on that they, that they need for their customers. Right. Um, uh, we've heard some people talking about moving at the speed of the, of the business, you know, yeah. and, and tell this kind of relative ability or inability to do that. So that's the, that's the pull. The push side, I think, is just some of the network economics, um, you know, the cost of power, uh, you know, the cost of maintaining sites, having to go and do things physically on sites. Um, if you've got 20, 30, 40,000 sites, that's an enormous amount of, of effort. So I think it's a, it's a combination. That's what will um, combine to, to accelerate the, the, the transition. You still got to work within the, the CapEx cycle, uh, you know, so that's, that's a, a pretty hard constraint, I think. Nobody wants to depreciate something kind of any faster than, than is already on the books. Um, but there are these other factors that push and, push and pull will we'll give them a rationale to, to move to more clarified architectures. Well, I, I'm, I'm presuming that the cost savings are one of the big drivers for the business case of moving uh, towards open and virtual systems, but what are the real cost savings? Do we know yet? Moving to open virtual RAN. Certainly one of the things that uh, was mentioned on the panel today and certainly we found in our research is it does, it does vary. Telcos are pretty cagey when it comes to it um, because they're all, they're all kind of different. You know, yeah. they have their different circumstances. Uh, you know, open RAN in a, across the country like Indonesia, completely different you know, compared to, you know, Luxembourg or, or Belgium, you know. So yeah. the topography is a, a factor in that. So it's quite difficult to, to maintain it. But if you look at what you know, people like Telus uh, have been very bullish about, about TCO, lower TCO, that wasn't why they did their, um, their transformation, but, but having done it, you know, they, they reported pretty positive results from that. So, so we do hear a mix of different, uh, different things, different experiences from around the, from around the world. World. Um, but it's, I think most operators uh, have been putting it into context. It's not, don't do open RAM for the TCO benefit, do it for the agility benefit, do it for the power benefit. You know, there are other, other factors that make the business case. It's not, it does, TCO on its own may not stand up. Are we, are we seeing greenfield operators uh, going pure virtual and open RAM for their system? Yeah, absolutely we are. Um, and um, I think it's inevitable as, uh, you know, for not just for the greenfield operators, but for um, for the operators that are moving to next generations of radio, they are going to be open. You know, they are going to go to open microservices-based architectures, um, and, and and some of that's even going to be dictated, I think, by new standards. So, for example, 6G is going to be entirely microservices-based. You will not have a proprietary stack. Yeah. Um, you know, on top of which you are going to you know build from a single vendor top to bottom, you know, at, at fully integrated, um, you know, offering as you did get in previous generations. The, the you know, the market has moved on um, and, um, you know, it's inevitable that, um, you know, openness is going to move on from there too. And presumably all software driven as well, which brings us to the, the next generation, of course, would be AI enabled brands as well. I mean, I'm a bit frightened to hear that already because, uh, as Iago said uh, from Verizon, we've been working with AI for years in developing the RAN and running the RAN, but having it completely AI enabled, I think we're, it's a bit in the future still. We look forward to it. Well, there's, I think the reality is there just is immense complexity, uh, and I think people are becoming accustomed to the idea of, of using AI to manage that complexity in, in, in real time. You yep. know, the amount of configuration parameters and so on. I mean, we've been doing this in in, in Solm in different ways for you know 10, 15 years. So it's not so alien in the RAM. It's not such a crazy concept, uh, and and so I think there's a bit more acceptance of that. Um, I think where things get a little murkier is is some of the discussion around. Uh, around reusing the RAN as kind of mini AI data centers, yeah, yeah. that's a little bit more um, speculative, if I yeah. want of a better word right now. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point um, in that, you know, the management of the RAN and, and actually, you know, new architectures, um, in especially open RAN, where um, you could have third party vendors introduce AI. Um, it's much easier to do that, to have innovative new vendors, you know, um, doing AI for managing uh, using AI for managing uh, the network itself, um, actually having GPUs, etc., built into a cell tower. Don't go there. Right. We're going to be right. talking for another half hour. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, jury's kind of out uh, as to the benefits of. That. We've actually have run out of time on this particular one, but I thought we were just starting to warm up well. Uh, Martin and Rob, thanks very much for being with me today. Yeah. And for those of you at home, if you do miss, miss any of our sessions of the main uh, program and even the uh, extra shots. You can view them online, I think from tomorrow onwards. So keep an eye out for those. We'll see you later today for another extra shot. Thank you.